Well, good morning. Thanks for being here. My name is Bob Abier. We're going to be talking today about the synchronization of lean and ERP. There's been some wonderful things that have happened in our profession over the last 10 years, and one of them is a term that we call next generation manufacturing. And today we're going to be talking about how you as a company, we've got all these initiatives going on in your heads right now about what lean might be and what ERP might be. We're going to talk about how you relate all of that to next generation manufacturing. This is a nice old open forum, so I certainly would um, welcome any questions or concerns, and if you want to talk about a specific as it relates to your company, we would certainly like to um, try to answer those questions for you. First, we're going to talk about a definition for lean and agile manufacturing. And those of you that do the reading on lean agile manufacturing will find many different definitions. We like what we call an intense defi uh, definition of lean. Lean agile manufacturing is the fundamental rethinking and radical redesign. Now notice we've got those highlighted. It's the fundamental rethinking and radical redesign of business and supply chain processes. Lean has a fundamental, talking about removing waste. Those processes to remove waste and to achieve dramatic improvement in critical measures. And one of the critical measures, we're measuring performance. We're measuring speed, cost, quality, and service. Whatever, you, uh, whatever and however you measure those things in your company, those are the things you're trying to dramatically improve. So if you've got a four-week lead time, we're not talking about an improvement to three weeks. We're talking about an improvement to one or two days. We need to understand what lean is. It's radical. It's fundamental change in how you run your business. If we're talking about a paperwork blizzard, we're not talking about a slight paperwork reduction. We're talking eliminating paper in purchasing. We're talking about the elimination of work orders on a factory floor. We're talking about the elimination of raw material inventory, period. So we're not just talking about some minor improvements. We're talking about rethinking the company from front to back. How you do lean and how another company does lean, so up to, it's up to the individual companies. We need to define it for every single company we go into. And we have a little exercise here that we'd like to go over and how you're going to define the various pieces of the puzzle. What are the things driving your lean program? The first piece might be cost. Are your costs out of control? Are you getting a tremendous amount of external pressure from your customer, uh, from your um, customers to dramatically reduce the, your uh, pricing policies to them? Um, if that's the case, and if you look at material labor and burden, where material is 50 to 60 percent of our total cost, if cost is the major driver for lean, then you need to focus tremendously on the supply chain. Supply chain is going to be your first year. Um, Focus. Now remember, when all of these pieces of the puzzle eventually get filled in, lean is a three to five year program, but for right now, your initial objective would be to go after the supply chain. If quality is your most important um, issue, you've got significant quality problems happening out in the marketplace, a lot of warranty costs, you've got quality problems on the shop floor in the form of scrap and rework, and quality starts to be in the one and two sigma ranges, then certainly you're going to have a totally different type of program than if you're just totally focused on cost. You're going to go after supplier certification, su supplier qualification, supplier SPC. You're going to go after dramatic improvements of quality on the shop floor, SPC and critical operations on the, on the factory floor. So again, cost may be a driver, quality may be a driver. Another driver could be delivery on service and service. Do you ship on time? And even if you ship on time, do you ship with a very short lead time? Remember, service delivery is on time with a very short lead time. So the challenges for your team might be you've got to dramatically improve that lead time, um, uh, the, the lead time. And that lead time could be everything on how fast your supply chain supplies a material into your facility, how fast you scream it through your facility, and how fast you get it out the door. And again, um, if delivery and service is your issue, a lot of value stream mapping um, initiatives um, uh, will be called for. Um, a tremendous amount of heat will be placed on the upfront analysis of your first tier suppliers and how they're delivering so that you can react to abnormal demands in the marketplace. Um, if service and delivery are also a problem, usually demand manage management becomes a very, very key initiative, better forecasting, better outbound, proactive uh, management of your demand. Empowerment. 
major issue for some companies. They might have morale issues, they could be having some employee uh, turnover issues, or they might just want to empower the employees more. How many signatures are on a purchase order today? Um, do you want to uh, empower your factory people to release orders? You know there's a real debate going on in our uh, manufacturing environments today about the authority of purchasing versus the authority of the people on the floor. And in a lean environment, purchasing negotiates a process. They don't order anymore. They don't do all the routine day-to-day -day ordering. That's left up to the day-to-day -day people on the factory floor. So purchasing places the annual blanket orders at the price and delivery terms necessary, and then someone from the factory can release those. And that might be a worker in a cell, it might be a warehouse person, it might be a planner, it could be anybody. But again, they're empowered to do what they need to do to get to, um, to master the daily flow of work coming into the factory. Um, another is cycle time is your entire lead time, and cycle time is what we call order to cash, from the time, um, and some people call it quote to cash, but from the time somebody quotes a product or orders a product to the time we get it out the door, what are all the activities that occur in there? What are all the various processes that occur in there? And how do we dramatically ca um, collapse that cycle time? Um, cycle time, by the way, is a major issue for many companies because this is the only way you're going to compete um, with the Chinas of this world, third world companies, the Vietnams, and and whatever, um, they can't get it on a boat and get it over here anywhere near as fast as you could run it through your plant. So if you, everything that's taking four weeks right now, if you could make it one or two days, um, you could make it very attractive to continue manufacturing in America. Safety. Many companies, two of our clients, um, both the Cushnet and Hasbro Corporation have embedded safety in as a core fundamental of their lean programs. Their VPP status firms um, have received special awards from the government um, for their safety programs and safety becomes a major component of lean. And if you do have a lot of people on um, long-term disability, lost time accidents or whatever, and safety is a significant issue in your plant if you're dealing with hazardous chemicals or whatever, um, sometimes safety becomes a core a principle. But again, we would, we would uh, launch totally different teams that have totally different efforts in the first three months um, if safety was your key driver. And then the last key driver is around flexibility. Is that do you need flexibility in your plant? Are your product lines changing? Or do you have very short product life cycles? Are you introducing a lot of new products? Dan. Bob, do you find many companies focusing on all of those at once, or do they typically just pick one of those or two of those to focus on? That's one of the dilemmas that we have, Dan, is that many companies look at all of this and say, yeah, I want one of them. They want all of that. And it really can screw up. It really can you know, jeopardize how a company really looks at their lean program. They start going in too many different directions, and that direction becomes very scattered. Most of the time, we encourage a company, although they're going to do all of this in the next two or three years, is to really focus on one or two of those pieces to the puzzle and go after that so they're not all over the place. Um, that uh, too many companies want everything right now and they really end up with a sub-optimized, we call them islands of automation. They got safety going in one part of the plant and they got some empowerment going in another and some delivery and service and they got all these various uh, scattered programs and they kind of don't all blend. So you've got to really kind of pick your plums and say what do we want to go after. Good question Dan, thank you. Global issues and trends driving next generation manufacturing. Next generation manufacturing came about in the mid 90s. A firm called the Agility Forum was established and partnered with the Iacocca Institute and in Lehigh University and literally tried to define what business was going to look like 10 or 15 or 20 years um, from now. And major corporations, Eastman Kodak, Texas Instruments, Motorola, all contributed a tremendous amount of money trying to define next generation manufacturing. And they came up with a little checklist. They said, well, what is happening in our society? What is happening in our manufacturing environment that's causing us to be so focused on next generation? Why do we need to change? And they said these were the fundamental things that were occurring. The first thing is increasing customer expectations. Customers expect way more now than what they expected 10 or 15 years ago. 10 or 15 years ago, a typical A&P supermarket had 10 to 20,000 items. Today, a superstore, a stop and shop, or a Walmart um, Superstore has over 100,000 SKUs. The customer is expecting more variety. The customer is expecting everything to have it right away. The customer is expecting unbelievably high levels of quality. The customer is expecting his car never to break down, even if it's a 10-year-old car. So expectations, and sometimes their 
are unreasonable expectations, but customers' expectations are dramatically increasing. At the same time, our SKUs are proliferating. If you walk into a dog food aisle today, remember 10 or 15 years ago there wasn't any such thing as a pet food aisle in a supermarket. Now an entire aisle is devoted to a pet food and there's a million different flavors of dog food. And you know a dog will eat concrete, he'll eat lipstick, he'll, he'll eat anything that he wants to, um, to eat. So you know those, um, all those flavored dog foods are really there for the people, um, not for the dog. But the fact of the matter is there is a very broad product range. Most of you uh, can feel that right now in your companies. That is also driving much smaller lot sizes. When, when we come up with new products, uh, sales almost never wants to drop the old products. So we're manufacturing a lot more in smaller lot sizes and we have very short model life. If you buy a Dell computer right now, um, the possibility of you buying that same Dell computer three months from now is remote. Dell, Dell's on to something else right now and they literally have um, no ability to get that other product. Again, if SKUs are proliferating, and this is an issue, you need unbelievably rapid new product introduction uh, processes in your plant, SMED, single minute exchange of dyes. You'll need to decide what your next generation of your company is going to look like if that, in fact, is a given. Flexible plant and equipment. Um, plant is, uh, plants are getting uh, to the point right now where we've got so many new products coming. We've got to think about a plant totally differently. We have to have wallless plants, the ability to reconfigure a plant almost daily. If you work, um, we do a lot of work with um, companies like Friendly Ice Cream who literally reconfigures the plant every day. If they're going to make syrups that day, they literally pull out of storage these massive assembly lines and they're making syrups all day today. Tomorrow, that may be a Sunday cup uh, line where they're making Reese's peanut butter cup sundaes and 100 people are now unwrapping little peanut butter cups and putting them in, um, in sundaes or whatever. But again, literally the ability to reconfigure your plant at a moment's notice. And if you're going to be lean and agile, that's a, a fundamental. Outsourcing is becoming a way of life. We don't like it. We're losing core manufacturing jobs here in America. It's a fact of life. We've got to build um, an organization to handle that. And we're not just outsourcing manufacturing jobs. Right now, it's everything. We're outsourcing customer service. We're outsourcing telephone hotlines for IT. Uh, we're outsourcing design and engineering now. And we've literally got to figure out how we're going to communicate with our outsourced partners. You can't ignore this. We're buying uh, design in China. We better figure out all the electronic tools that we're going to need to pass designs back and forth very quickly so that we've got the entire um uh, internal facilities that we have here domestically in the United States totally synchronized with our outsourced partners. That outsourcing, by the way, may be company-owned outsourcing or private um, uh, companies that you're outsourcing to, but nevertheless we need the ability to communicate at undreamed of speed. Um, everything is a commodity. Um, many of the people in the room are, get insulted by this. This is part of a senior management um, presentation that we do. And when you tell a lot of senior managers that their product is a commodity, they get insulted because everybody likes to think their product is unique. Uh, the fact of the matter is almost everybody in this room has a product that the customer can go somewhere else and buy. Uh, so if the customer is not, com is not comfortable um, with your delivery schedules, with your quality, or the way he's being treated, or the amount of time it's taking to get a quote, he can certainly go shopping and because of search engines like Google or whatever he could pretty much find that um, in a moment's notice and so again if everything is a commodity you better make sure that whenever a customer calls you you never give them the opportunity to go shopping that you quote online and you close online you take that order immediately Again, next generation manufacturing, seeing massive disinflation in the marketplace. Almost all of you have seen in the last 10 years, especially in the last five years, dramatic price rollback. Where for years and years in America, we could raise the prices every five to seven years. And now we're seeing a totally different trend. It is what we call a big box retail, is, uh, whether it be Home Depots or Lowe's, or whether it be um, Walmart or Kmart or the major um, um, drug chains, the CVSs of this world, um, and the Walgreens coming in. Again, driving prices to a very low level, asking major manufacturers to roll back prices. This massive disinflation in the marketplace is going to continue for some time. We've seen some strengthening in the last uh, few months because of oil price issues, but for the most part, massive disinflation in the marketplace is going to be with us for some time, and we need the ability to put new systems in place to handle that. Um, what's driving next generation manufacturing? Environmental and recycling issues are becoming uh, far more complex. You're, we're going to need to 
come up with the ability to recycle and repair and, um, and move products through very elaborate changes. We can't dump chemicals in rivers anymore and we can't um, dump chemicals in the ground and push chemicals up smoke stacks anymore. And um, as part of our um, lean efforts, we better make sure that we've got byproduct and co-product features in, these, in the software and the ability to handle all the things that we're going to need to do um, if we're going to compete in today's uh, business world. Global issues and trends driving next generation manufacturing, number eight, ability to process information to treat masses of customers of individuals. We see blue jean companies making customized uh, jeans for individuals. We're seeing shoe companies making customized uh, shoes, uh, appliance industry. Um, focusing on putting your family crest on waffle irons or on toasters. Uh, the ability to process information to treat masses of customers or individuals is going to be a major, major issue for almost all of you. It's the way you can differentiate. We're seeing major banks right now and investment houses putting up websites that um, for each individual, for all their key investors, so their, indiv so their, their investors can be can be treated just not like the masses go up on everybody else's website but a unique website just for them. We're seeing constant training being caused by technology and downsizing as employees are, are released, as companies are, are downsizing and sometimes not through layoffs just through um, normal attrition. We're seeing people doing multiple jobs oftentimes not trained well. We're seeing um, ERP systems being installed in a lot of companies today with very minimal um, training uh, and so the people understand the basics, they know how to enter an order, but they don't really understand all the functionality um, behind the scenes. Um, we have other presentations uh, that we call um, ERP optimization um, processes where we go into companies and literally say how are you using the system and it is amazing how a lack of understanding uh, there is on how all these auto modifiers and everything else in the system actually work. Many of the people that are using the system don't really understand it. Um, number 10, computer networking, telecommunications, and the internet are accelerating the change of pace in technology. When I was a young whippersnapper, I got out of college in, in 64 and started to um, go to work full time. In the late 60s, I actually went over to Portugal. We were buying castings over in Portugal for a valve company that I was working on. And it took about eight months for us by the time we, um, I made trips over there and we made some of the initial... Um, Context. At the time we actually got workable samples and actually probed them out in a valve and did all our testing and that whole process would take a week or two now. You'd literally go up into Google now and put Portugal castings and you get a list of every single company and um, you'd send them drawings over the internet and you'd have some samples in the mail in a couple of days. Uh, so the whole process has changed dramatically and well, you better make sure you have the right information systems in your factory to handle this. Again, next generation manufacturing, number 10, is going to be an unbelievable a problem for most companies if your software is not a key enabler. Ease of access to global production networks. Um, anybody can get anything anywhere. The competition can get anything anywhere. And remember, many of you have 15 to 25 dollar wage rates, uh, fully burdened wage rates in your factory right now, and you're competing against the global wage rates in the one dollar range. Um, it's going to be a major, major problem for us as wages and job skills um, shift. But again, that's going to drive a whole new model for your factory. doesn't mean the job has to go away. It means if this is a fundamental, what's driving change, you better figure out a whole new way to compete because you're not going to be able to compete on wages. Visioning process. I think we'll have some good discussion and a good time with these next few overheads. There's a process that all companies must go through when they're starting ERP and when they're starting lean. They really need to have a process to say, what do I want to be when I grow up? How do I want my company to look? And many companies just start embarking on ERP, especially during Y2K. Everybody was just sprinting because they didn't feel their software was going to be um, acceptable in, um, as, as the, as the uh, century changed. So they just sprinted the installed software and quite frankly hadn't rethought many of their processes. Today companies literally need to say, what do I want to be when I grow up? What are the corporate goals? What are the strategies that we're going to use to get to those goals? What do our business rules need to be? And we're going to be talking about the next hour about these business rules. What are the tactical things that I have to do? And eventually, what are the detailed plans? Who's going to do what by when? So so we 
we live that dream. Our lean visioning process is pretty easy to understand. We have corporate goals. What are those corporate goals? We'll have a little bit of fun uh, with a couple of overheads about what corporate goals are. And then we've got to develop a global lean strategy. We'll show you some statements that some companies put together. We have one in this presentation from the electronics company. It says, when I grow up, what do I want to be? And, and, and how am I going to define that to my workers? And how will that definition help me advance all of the teams and the structure around my lean and ERP efforts? Then I'll need to develop my factory and distribution goals. And what are those distribution goals? An example of a distribution goal in my factory, I'm going to ship in one day lead times, or I'm going to cross dock 50% of my items from distribution. So what do those goals need to be? We'll talk about those. And what are our strategies then to support these lean strategies and business rules? Uh, an example of a business rule and we'll cover some of those um, in a few minutes. But an example of a business rule is everything received today is entered into the system in one hour or is entered into the system before the people go home. Whatever you want for your business rules, the companies need the well-defined business rules. It's a fundamental of ERP, by the way, to have those business rules. You need to develop departmental goals. We're going to talk about those. But what's the departmental goal for purchasing? Is it... Um, the elimination of pass through orders, a departmental goal and a business rule for purchasing might be nobody goes home until all orders, all pass through orders are rescheduled. Remember an ERP system is dumb. If you have a pass due date in a system it has no idea when it's coming in, it doesn't know what to do. Um, so it shoves this stuff all in one box. So departmental goals and departmental lean strategies might be very focused around rescheduling and short lead times and everything else. And then departmental business rule that will talk about what some of those um, departmental business rules are. Again, though, this thinking must be embedded into all lean and ERP implementations. That's a fundamental. You've got to think about all of these when you're doing your ERP um, implementations and when you're starting all of your lean um, project initiatives. Dan. Bob, are ERP business rules and ERP procedures the same thing? Are they a shorter version of a procedure? Yeah, that's a good question, Dan. Policies and procedures are totally different. Um, business rules um, and documentation are different. Um, docu uh, uh, documentation is how to do it. How do I enter an order? And it's a detailed list of what you do. But your, your, your business rules are, I'm going to enter all orders in one minute, or I'm going to enter 95% of the orders online. Those are rules. Those are rules and they're totally different than the Sarbanes-Oxley or than the ISO type documentation that you have. And companies really need to differentiate uh, rules from documentation. One of my favorite, when we talked about uh, developing corporate goals and objectives. Uh, one of my favorite ones, my favorite um, corporate goal and objectives came out of Federal Express a few years ago. They took out, on two uh, consecutive days, they took out um, some ads in the Wall Street Journal. The first um, day of the ad, the president of Federal Express said, um, I went to my customers and I asked them what they wanted from Federal Express. And here's what they said. And this was, again, these are the only words besides that little introductory paragraph on the entire full page ad. It said, I want it on time and in the proper hands. I want it done correctly, accurately, exactly, precisely, perfectly, efficiently, reliably, um, expertly, proficiently, faithfully, totally, absolutely, unequivocally, unmitigatedly, maturely, flawlessly, supremely, unsurpassedly. Well, look at those words. Um, and certainly without fault. And basically that first paragraph means I want it perfect. I want it unharmed. I want it unbought. I want it untainted and unscrewed up. And most of all, I want it done cheap. And what he said the second day, he says, I read this, and, I, and I, I was trying to digest this, and I looked at my mission statement, and he said, my mission statement didn't say this. And if you look at most mission statements today, um, they're, they're, they don't really say a heck of a lot. The mission statement for an Eastman Kodak might be, I want to be a worldwide producer of quality photographic products, or number one, um, whatever. But the individuals really can't digest what that means to me and my job. And so what he did was he took out a second-day ad, and he said, 
It's your job not to screw. Oh, he said, this is a message to my employees. He says, it's your job not to screw this up or make any mistakes or drop the ball or blow the game. Get it there faster and quicker and more reliably and more efficiently. Do it first rate, top notch, without a hitch, absolutely flaw uh, flawlessly. He got a little trouble in here and he said, botch this one in here, out of here, history, finished, toast, terminated, lunch, gonzo, dead, kaput. Oh, and one more thing, do it for less money than you've ever done it before. Uh, a couple of days later, and so the, there were some human resource people that wrote in and said they understood it was just an ad and all of this stuff, but they thought some of this was a little too intense. Um, and his response was, hey, I really mean this. If you can't do it, go to work for the competition. Go to work for somebody else. Go to work for the post office if you want. Um, but the fact of the matter is, that's a mission statement that everybody can understand, that he really was trying to drive things to very high levels of excellence. And he said, our major clients, by the way, are shipping packaging at phenomenal, at significant discounts, 30, 40, 50 percent discounts. So we've got to be able to do it unbelievably efficiently, and we've got to do it at a very high level of reliability. Most companies today need to make a statement about what lean and agile is going to mean to them. This is a, a statement that was made by one of our clients, that, and their name is in Townsend, they're a large electronic manufacturer um, that makes uh, test equipment. And basically they said, we need to really define what we want our business to look like in the next couple of years. Um, they were installing... Um, a large ERP system and they were installing lean at the same time and they said we really got to make sure that all of this is blending and so notice these statements and these statements may not work for you totally but whatever works for you you're going to need to help define our factory supports rapid configure to order manufacturing no sub assemblies which means all sub assemblies are going to be made in demand when the demand for the end item comes about we plug and play cabling Plug and play cabling means everything's going to fit in, no soldering, no massive assembly. Um, software will recognize everything that's cabled in, all the features and options, and there'll be no finished goods. Everything will be configured to order. All major components and boards and assemblies are powered up at the supplier. Now, if you make that statement, you need to now set up over the next 12 months three or four major lean teams to go out to the major suppliers and figure out how to do that. Is that moving your test equipment out to the supplier's test equipment? Whatever it, whatever it, um, whatever it means, you're going to need to figure out how to do that because you just can't make the statement. These statements are being made so that you can relate this um, to the actual teams that will be our launch is part of your lean effort. Um, it also means, by the way, that you'll be configuring your ERP software totally differently. Dan. Bob, does that mean that when you install your ERP system, you should be looking at these things and making your ERP system work for you? I think that many people are installing ERP today um, when they first look at it, that they're, they're installing ERP today just to have a good inventory system or a system that will track purchase orders or production orders, that they're not really talking about using ERP to drive them to whole new levels of excellence. And I think that's real, a real problem for us. So making these statements forces us to look at ERP as the enabler to, um, uh, to bring us to a whole new level of efficiency. Notice the next one. Our factory will be level loaded. We will ship, ship the same number of machines the first week of the month as we ship the last week of the month. Most people, by the way, have a tremendous end of month, end of quarter, end of year um, cycle associated with it. It puts tremendous amount of pressure on the plants. You oftentimes pay premium money in outbound and inbound freight. You're paying premium money at suppliers to get stuff in. Um, and so literally we've got to figure out ways to load levelless. Many companies put proactive demand plans planning processes in place. But in any case, when you make that statement, you may never quite get there, but at least it'll force you to put some policies and procedures in place to try to do that. Also, it's making sure you don't have incentive systems um, that, that, are, uh, that are actually driving some of this. Some people have sales incentive systems that actually cause that end of month uh, surge. A customer service and fast quote will be legendary in our industry. Uh, those statements, by the way, should be on everybody's um, 
uh, lean agile manufacturing uh, quote we will be lean and agile uh, when customer service and fast quote um, what does that mean does that mean that you're going to have fast quote on webs that every salesman's laptop is going to have it does that mean that customer service is empowered now to quote it doesn't have to go into a quotation department and 80 and 90 percent of all quotations will be handled um, online whatever it means it needs to be well defined and you need to put up teams most of our clients all put up what we call front end lean teams um, um, as, as part of their lean initiatives and almost all of our clients are strongly encouraged to put customer service and quotation teams in place. And number five, our equipment is best in industry exceeding 5,000 hours mean time between failure. Um, there are many companies in the electronics industry uh, that uh, as that number drops to 1,000 or 2,000 or whatever, warranty costs are going out of sight, companies won't rebuy your equipment, and does this mean that we need to have redundant circuitry on our boards that are in our computers so it's doing a lot of self-diagnosing? Whatever it means, it's, and does this meet the design, and this is 12 to 18 months away from actually happening because of the design cycle is so long, but if you make the statement, you've got to literally say in your company what are you doing to assure that you're reaching that goal. Quality at the de design level becomes institutionalized. Um, most people know by the way that the lead time and the quality are built in at the design level that you can't try to get um, cost out of the product. You can't try to improve quality after the product is released. So you're a new product design, um, a new product release programs have got to be you have, have got to be institutionalized to the lean type of thinking, uh, to the lean type of thinking to the nth degree. Uh, seven, all processes are robust and under formal SPC control. Again, SPC, uh, we need to talk about that. The old way of doing SPC was educate, bring everybody off of the factory floor, um, educate them in SPC, and then everybody started filling out control charts, and there wasn't enough engineers or supervision to even look at them, and the whole program fell apart. And now we know that you want to draw your plant, you want to break your plant into six or eight or ten sectors, and every quarter do a lean initiative on your primary equipment, not on all equipment, um, um, get SPC going, and over 12 to 24 months you'll have formal SPC in place and key processes. Companies that are trying to do this all at one time um, make a tremendous mistake. But again, if you're making a statement, we will be lean and agile when, you're going to need to say what are the teams and the training and everything else I need to put SPC in place. People will be the foundation of our effort. Number eight, some of these get um, get really interesting. People will be the foundation of our effort. The people will be empowered, they'll be certified and trained. If you make the statement, what does this mean? If you may, if, if it says I'm going to have everybody certified, it says my engineers are certified, my production inventory control people are certified in Apex, my purchasing people are certified in um, by the um, um, Purchasing Management Association, that training plans exist for all departments, that everybody is cross-trained, that people are empowered. If you're making these statements, you've got to say, what does it mean? Who can sign purchase orders? Who can release product to the shop floor? Are the people in quality control empowered to um, disposition a product? Their scrap or rework, or do they not need to get approval somewhere? So if you're making these statements, you've got to literally say, what are the things that I'm going to change in my environment? environment, what are the things I'm going to change in my company, uh, so, I, uh, so I'm living those. Inspections are reduced or eliminated does not mean inspectors are reduced or eliminated. In the new lean world, um, inspections are eliminated because we're not inspecting product, but inspectors still come around and they're inspecting processes. They're seeing that machines are calibrated uh, properly, that inspection devices that the workers are using are calibrated properly, that the worker that's running that machine has been trained properly, that the machine is certified and has had the right maintenance on it. So there we're inspecting processes now rather than products, a very, very powerful um, uh, technology that's available to us with things like total productive maintenance. Um, but we really need to ask ourselves if we're going to do this, what are the teams and everything else we're going to put together so we make sure we can live the dream of number nine. Number 10, we will be closely linked to our suppliers with the latest of JIT2 supplier partnering and purchasing philosophies. JIT2 is a process that was originally developed by the Bose Institute. Um, 
Bose basically said, the only way I'm going to synchronize all of my factories with my suppliers is to put on-site personnel. So in some instances, Bose people were out at the supplier's factory a half a day, sometimes full-time. In other instances, the supplier's people were in the Bose factory, literally sitting down at the Bose ERP system, placing orders on themselves, working on telephones back and forth, and making sure the factories were uh, synchronized. It's a very, very powerful tool, especially if you have reasonably local suppliers, but um, you can assure that all the materials moving into the plant is certified, you don't have to inspect it anymore, that products coming in under uh, vendor managed inventory control, um, you don't need any people in purchasing by the way because the on-site personnel are placing their own orders in the plant, so the purchasing people are out negotiating new orders, not handling the day-to-day -day ordering of material, they're only negotiating purchase orders. Consignment inventories means no inventory is showing on the books until we actually use it, do we actually consume it? Um, daily deliveries, sometimes hourly deliveries are being all coordinated by these on-site uh, personnel. So again, if you make the statement, we will be lean and agile when, 12 to 24 months from today, this is how you're going to live. Now you may make the statement, we will be closely linked to our A suppliers and only the A product lines will have it, but at least you need to make the statement. Point of use inventory is utilized. Point of use inventory means from the outside supplier, um, everything is delivered to point of use. So the outside supplier's truck, when they rolls up, it, your, your um, receiving people don't unload the truck. The outside supplier um, unloads the truck and puts it right into your point of consumption point. Um, it would mean the same thing, by the way, as product is flowing through your plant when Operation 1 does the product, that Operation 1 operator moves the product to the point of use, Operation uh, number 2, um, nothing moves into a central work and process storage areas. Point of use inventory can also be done by your manufacturing, um, uh, but by your trucking system as you deliver to your customer, by the way. And um, there's many companies right now that are loading the, the shelves at Walmart, or Kmart, Coca-Cola and Breadman and all of that stuff. That's the way they're doing it. Their root salespeople actually move everything right to the point of um, use or point of consumption. 12. Shop and office embrace cleanliness and orderliness disciplines. There is a tremendous lean tool called 5S, wonderful program, talks about orderliness and cleanliness. Uh, some companies don't do that early on when they start lean because they can't cash it. So how do you show the return on investment from a clean plant? But it is a fundamental and many companies are, are embracing this as a fundamental and are doing it as part of lean because they know it's the right thing to do. Um, 13, 14, and 15 are absolute givens to any lean or ERP system that you must have formal training plans, a 12-month training plan listing every person in the department and what skill set they're going to get. Is this a purchasing person? Are they going to get supply chain training? Are they going to get negotiations training? What are they going to get besides the standard ERP training so that they have the tools to do their job? It is shocking to me the amount of times I walk into purchasing departments and the people that are working there have had no formal negotiation skills training. Um, Oh, they've had very little ERP training, just the absolute rudimentary training on how to cut a purchase order, not really understanding all the logic behind the system and how that system could really enable them to do a better job. Uh, formal measurements need to exist for all departments. Um, I like whiteboards outside of all departments, which we call dashboards. Those formal measurements, production control might be, I want to see the number of overdue purchase orders each day. I want somebody to go over and post them. I want the planners to know and own inventory. We walk into many plants today and say as a planner, you manage this line of inventory? Yes. How many dollars do you have out on the factory floor? How many dollars do you have in raw material? Many planners have no idea. Um, and again, if, you're not, if they're not aware of what those numbers are, they're not managing them and they're not improving them. And then formal business rules exist for all departments. We talked about those business rules earlier, but business rules are things like everything received today is entered into the system um, today or is entered into the system in one hour. Everything shipped today or everything rejected today um, is disposed of within one hour or disposed of within 24 hours so that you have rules around all of your major processes. And then a statement that I like, it's to say we are going to be a modern manufacturing company, that we are going to embrace the latest lean technologies. We're going to do SPC and 5S and total productive maintenance, and we're going to have formal um, Six Sigma type design of experiment um, thinking, and we're going to do SMED um, 
single minute exchange of diet, which is a rapid setup reduction program. Again, making these statements, and the minute you make the statement, you now need to be able to show, okay, in the next 12 months, what machines are we going to do setup reduction on? What, um, what machines are we going to do total productive maintenance? Because if you say you're going to do on every single machine in the plant, the project's almost always going to fail. So we need to decide on which ones, and at the end of 24 months, you'll have total productive maintenance done, or you'll have SPC done. But again, it's making the statement and then showing the detailed plans to support that statement. Next we want to talk about our factory or distribution goals. What are some of the goals? We'd like to give you some examples right now to show you some examples of the goals that a distribution company or a manufacturing company could have. And I'm not going to take the time to go through all of these. There's tons of these things available to us. In fact, if you leave your business cards later, we'll give you some of the models that are associated with this and we'll certainly send you the, um, the, the diskette that has uh, the uh, CD that has all of these measurements on it. But look at some of these first me measurements. 98% of all shipments will be made on or prior to a scheduled shipment date. And 2% of shipments will be made within five days of the scheduled shipment date. So the ones that you're going to miss, you're going to get within five days. You're only going to be five days late on 2% or whatever. And what's most important is I don't care what you come up with for the numbers. I care that you have these goals and objectives quantified. Without that, by the way, we're going to show you some number, another example in a few minutes of customer service levels for a make-to-start company and a make-to-order company. And you're going to see how important it is that we quantify all of that. Notice some of the others. If you've got lost time injuries, uh, less than, you know, one per thousand man hours or whatever. Um, with less than, you know, 0.04% of the injuries resulting in a permanent disability. So if lost time now, if lost time is not even an issue for you, you've got an unbelievably self, self, uh, safe plant, you might not want to even put that in. Um, but if you do have, in fact, a lot of employees out in dis disability, your disability costs are high, you need as part of operations, again, whether you're a manufacturer or a distributor, you need to help define some of these. So I strongly urge you to spend some time going over some of these um, lean objectives. Then what is your factory or distribution lean strategy? And here's one that we picked, by the way, for a one-stop custom shop. This happens to be um, a large, um, uh, uh, I shouldn't say a large, a $50 million lighting company, um, the part of a bigger company, but they decided to put a custom shop in place. And what their vision was, they said, we want to be able to have a custom shop that would have one location, one team, one dedicated focus, one day lead times. I want to be able to customize the light. They're a distributor and they have some problems, quite frankly, of, of margins eroding like crazy. And value-added product can, um, can oftentimes get premium margins. So where a lot of their product is 15 to 25 percent margins, they were looking at this value-added customizing process of returning about 35 percent margins. So they said this will give us a significant competitive advantage and it will provide economic support for baseline distribution, which means when somebody orders this custom thing, they'll also order all the standard stuff at the same time. Now the, the, the dilemma with this, they said when they started to develop the vision, they said, do we want to do this for which customers, do we, which products and which people? They might not want to do it with all B and C customers. It might be just A customers they want to do it in. And they might want to do it only on specific product lines because you can't keep um, customizing uh, tools and product available for everything that's possibly customizable. You can't have 45,000 colors of paint um, if somebody just wants it painted a different color. So which customers and which products and which people in your organization, which people are going to be involved and dedicated to this custom shop. And most importantly, if you give this one or two day lead times, nobody can compete with you. So again, it's establishing the vision for a one-stop custom shop. Now notice how they came up with their goals and objectives. They said, first of all, it's going to be a quotation process. That 99% of all sales requests will be quoted in one day. And all, and all of the requests will be quoted in two days. The one or two that doesn't get a five, whatever you come up with, will be a couple of more days. But you need to make those statements. 98% of all jobs within X amount of days will be shipped on time. And every single and all the jobs will be shipped in five working days. Yes, Dan. Question. Bob, these are great goals, but do you find that most ERP systems out there today can su support these goals, can provide you the, the software and infrastructure to, to make these goals a reality? 
Well, almost a lot of the new software product today can, can absolutely do this stuff. Some of the older legacy systems, they still struggle with. It. They don't have all the functionality needed to, to do this. But anybody that's installed, certainly in the in um, uh, most recent five years, uh, certainly since Y2K, this system should be able to, uh, to do this. They might not have a lot of that functionality turned on. And they might need to contact their providers to get that functionality turned on. But um, this should be achievable with almost everybody that's using any kind of a modern ERP system. Some of the old, real old um, MRP systems can't, um, they, they don't handle customizing easily and they don't handle some of this stuff. But for the most part, the people, um, most of the people can, can easily handle this. Again, what's most important is not is this what your um, um, is, is this what your goals and objectives need to be. It's what's most important is if you decide you're going to have a custom shop. What are my goals? How am I going to measure? What's my dashboard going to look like? So when you have some time away from this workshop, you want to take a look at some of those um, rules and how would you. Um, how would you relate to them? I think five and six, though, have some tremendous meaning to it. It says, hey, 25% or 10% or 5% of all orders will be custom orders. If you're putting this whole operation together, you better make sure your sales force is selling it for you. And so you better be tracking how much of this custom business that you're getting um, because the margins and everything are so good. Um, but then again, if it, doesn't, uh, if it doesn't work out, you've got a lot of people and resources dedicated to a business that's not um, returning any... Um, uh, net value to you. Lean Agile Manufacturing was developed in the, in the, in the mid-90s and they came up with that um, at the Iacocca Institute came up with uh, some core principles and, and they, these aren't the pure core principles but it's pretty much what everybody is trying to follow today. First core principle, everything moves within four hours. And again, if you don't like these for your factory, rewrite them. But you need to have core principles for your factory. If you make a statement that everything moves within four hours, and then your second statement says, if the downstream center can't use it, I'm going to shut off the upstream work center. I'm going to try to get a flow going in my company. And notice number three, everything moves to point of consumption. All of these first three items are unbelievably focused on flow. If you make that and say, how would we live that on our factory floor? How would we live that in our supply chain? If I'm bringing in corrugated, what am I doing bringing it in if I'm not going to use it? Use it today. But why do I bring it in? Most corrugated suppliers are all close by, which certainly within an hour drive of everybody. And why aren't they looking at what your assembly or packing schedule is and loading their truck and building, bringing you in the corrugated just that you need? So again, if you make these statements, it will force you to align all your teams and lean effort with those. Um, number four, when you do the value stream mapping processes, 50% improvement on year, on year of thinking, you're trying to get rid of 50% of the process steps. You're trying to reduce rework by 50%, set up time by 50%, and scrap. Now, if you can't do that every 12 to 18 months, then say it's going to be a 50% year-on-year um, improvement on our A items or on this product line. But what's most important is you make the statement of what our factory is going to look like. Um, there'll be no paperwork. We're going to run paperless um, ERP on the factory floor. No paperwork. Um, we're going to eliminate paperwork in purchasing. We're going to eliminate paperwork in order entry. We are not going to print out hard copies of customer orders. If we print out, um, if we enter a purchase order, we're not going to print out purchase orders and send them to the receiving department so the receiving department has a copy of the purchase order. When goods are received, they'll look it up on the computer. So we really need to think about when we use the term no paperwork, what does it mean? You're buying these beautiful systems that have the ability to produce a paperwork blizzard if you let them. But you've really got to rethink your strategies around paperwork and get rid of as much paperwork and filing and everything else as you possibly can. The next item, number six, is no material handling. And that means all your material handling devices must have wheels on them, pallets must have wheels or carriers that you put the pallets on and workers push the work from one work center to another. Also, it means you need to relay out work centers so that theater work centers are very in close proximity or embedded right into the work centers so that you've eliminated material handling. But what we're trying to do is to eliminate material handling as a job description, to eliminate um, um, separate people. Many of our clients, by the way, do not allow any powered vehicles on the factory floor. 
They're only allowed in warehouses or whatever um, because the factories are getting very um, 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 uh, they're getting very cluttered. They're, when you start to set up cells and everything else, park trucks can't negotiate in and out of those cells. Um, they're major industry issues, uh, injury issues. Plus, um, park trucks also um, cost about thirty-five thousand dollars and have a thirty-five to fifty thousand burdened individual driving them. Um, so, oftentimes, we have very expensive people driving material handling equipment, and itself is. Um, um, it, the equipment itself is um, very expensive, so again, if you're going to hit some home runs and lean, you want to try to limit all your, all your material handling. No labor reporting. Major issue for us in most companies. What do you guys think about no labor reporting? Anybody here doing no labor reporting? Dan? Yeah. Bob, on no labor reporting, we find that very difficult to even think about. For years, our finance department's been telling us that we got to track labor to the nth degree on the shop floor from operation to operation. How do we change that kind of thinking and lean and uh, embed it in our new ERP system? Well, remember, we talked about dramatically rethinking all of our process right now. Labor in most companies, if you look at cost of goods sold, labor is five, maximum 10% of our total cost. Um, it's one or two percent of sales, our labor costs, and most of the time labor reports are being filled out while a machine is down. The worker stops the machine, fills out paperwork, goes over, decides to wand in or out. Um, nobody's paying attention to the machine during that time. Most of the time also labor has figured out the way how to beat the system. So if, they, if you, people are looking at productivity issues and say, I need labor reporting to see who's productive, the fact of the matter is you really don't need to know that. Um, the workers already know the bad workers out there. I mean, the, the supervision already knows the bad workers on the factory floor, and you don't need labor reporting to identify your bad workers. Um, also, a tremendous amount of non-value-added time is spent by shop supervision correcting all these labor reports and everything else. And... Um, um, so, um, and most, uh, and most of the time, people saying, uh, you know, we come from these societies where we want to know what everybody's doing at, at all times or whatever, but um, labor reporting really needs to be challenged. It's a really a non-value-added activity. If you can do labor reporting while your machines are running and nobody is, um, there's not one minute of lost time, maybe I consider it, but for the most part, it's very, it's, va it's non-value-added and um, it shouldn't be needed. Look at number eight, um, no computer transactions or systems on the factory floor. The exception to that might be quality attribute systems, but what the heck do you need production orders on the factory floor for? What do you need to be reporting or tracking material from one work center to another? Um, to some of you, by the way, that's going to look like some kind of radical thinking. Hand up. That is really radical thinking to us. I mean, based on our ERP system and IT and the issues that are putting us and asking us to do on the shop floor and anywhere else that we do processing, they're saying more transactions. How do we get away with that now? Well, you know, we talk about lean. There's a whole lean in accounting, and this workshop certainly can't, can't go there. But, we need, you know, there's a couple of reasons why everybody wants transactions on the floor. One of them is for inventory reporting. It says, where is everything out there so I can adequately report it in my financial systems? Well, the fact of the matter is, is everything is out there about halfway through the system. If we look on average, so again, the, um, the in, in lean accounting, basically work and process accounting says, I'm going to put 100% of the material and half of the labor in burden and at the end of the month I'm going to put a journal entry in there and that's how I value my work and process. The second thing is, is where is it so I can promise it? And if that's a big issue, um, instead of having every single thing tracked, you're basically saying to your shop floor supervision, we want you to track only what's past due. And if it's past due in your work center, we need to reschedule it each day. So when somebody calls up and say, where's my item? That's really not the question you're trying to address. Is, is it going to ship on time? And if it's not, what's the latest shipping? And that's what we're really trying to do with this. I know this, gonna, this is going to take a lot of really radical thinking, but you need to have accurate dates in your system anyway. You need to have a mentality on that factory floor that nobody goes home with any past due work orders, no past due production orders, no past due purchase orders, no past due customer orders. That rescheduling has to happen every day. Um, and if that rescheduling was accurate, you wouldn't need to track all of that stuff through that factory floor. So you still need a very powerful ERP system in the front room and back room, but it's not necessarily needed on the floor. If it says to make this on Tuesday, make it on Tuesday and don't let that work center go home until it's made. That's really the mindset we need to drive.
Number nine, assume pipeline flow, no backflow. Again, a fundamental of flow and lean is everything flows in a straight line or U-shape. And if the product has to reverse and go back to work centers a second time or whatever, we really need to challenge that and redesign plants and everything so um, uh, backward flow doesn't occur. No inspection or testing, we talked about this, is um, designing robust processes so that we're getting a, uh, a very high levels of quality coming in from the outside. Uh, and then once it's on the factory floor, that the uh, workers are empowered to test and inspect their own material. As we look at this next overhead, 11 through 23, some of these, some, some of these are, um, have certain different levels of importance. No sub-assemblies on the floor. We talked about this when we looked at Townsend's uh, statement. But again, sub-assemblies cause a tremendous amount of computer transactions. They cause us to commit raw material and component material before it's really needed and oftentimes find ourselves disassembling material and oftentimes have to destroy material when we disassemble it. Minor components get destroyed. So again, most companies are saying no, no sub-assemblies. Carrier control. Carrier control, by the way, those of you who study lean, this is an unbelievably exciting aspect of, of our lean manufacturing. Carrier control has got nothing to do with the trucking company. It basically says all of the carriers that I'm going to use in my manufacturing process are going to introduce the product to the next work center properly. So it's going to be soldiered probably. It's coming in from the outside. It's not going to be packed in corrugated boxes with all kind of wrapping paper around it. It's going to come in boxes that are soldiered and uh, that are soldiered property and properly, and that so a first operation can easily and quickly just open up the top of the box and start feeding them into the machine. A carrier control also. If you're feeding a paint line, uh, you're not going to put the stuff on the previous operation in a pallet. You're going to move the paint racks um, directly into that um, secondary location and the worker as they're finishing up that operation will rack the paint racks um, and then the paint racks will be moved or just hung right on a overhead trolley and moved to the paint line. And that's what we mean by carrier control. Very important part of lean. Um, all parts and processes are under SPC control. We talked about that earlier. Zone your plant and get all your SPC uh, planning done over the next couple of years. No holding containers. An example of a holding container is just what we talked about in the paint line where we put the um, stuff off of one operation, we put it in a pallet, and then we move it to the paint line, and then it goes on a paint rack. That's called the holding container. There's no need for it, and you want to eliminate all multiple handling containers. Some companies will actually mix product in a container, pump it into another container, hold it, and and then dispense out of that container later. Whatever your manufacturing container is, you'll dispense out of that container. Um, the next two are pretty straightforward. Direct ship from last operation. Uh, anything that's happening or whatever your last operation is on the factory floor, the goods will be packaged right there. They'll be um, uh, put under skid control or whatever. Our shipping papers will be printed out and attached and everything is packaged and buttoned up at last operation. We shouldn't have a separate packaging department um, in, um, in the shipping area. A direct receipt for first operation, this is where your outside suppliers deliver product just like the bread man does at the supermarket, comes in the front door and puts the bread away. Your major suppliers would um, put stuff in uh, first operation work cells and load the trucks themselves and deliver uh, directly. 17, no inventory. Um, those are all the consignment and vendor managed processes, by the way. So uh, inventory is not in the system until you actually consume it. In the case of Eastman Kodak, by the way, single-use cameras for, uh, flow through the plant, and after the camera is made and put into inventory, all the inventory is back flushed and all the suppliers are paid with that. Dan. Bob, we're just struggling to go from uh, three turns to ten turns. Now you're saying no inventory. Are you seeing that as a possibility uh, in ERP and in lean? Is that really happening out there? Well, you want to make the statement. Many companies are saying there'll be no inventory for 80% of my A items. That's an achievable goal in the first 12 months of lean for many companies. To go totally inventoryless across the board may not be so much. Um, some companies, by the way, are, are bringing in their own um, custom, uh, custom warehouses. They're clearing customs on their own site. So, um, so and that inventory, by the way, is because it hasn't cleared um, uh, customs completely until they use it. It's still in the hands of the supplier at that point. Um, we really need to define what no inventory means. And it might mean just no inventory for A items. And it might mean, mean no inventory for A items for these suppliers. 
But we need to think like that. And, it, and we can't get into the process that GM did what, with Lopez a few years ago, a famous purchasing agent that just said, uh, we'll get rid of the inventory at GM by just pushing it back in the supply chain and let the suppliers handle it. We've literally got to reduce everybody's inventory. So it's something in it for everybody. And we still need to have enough inventory in the supply chain to react to that abnormal demand, the, uh, the, the demand issues that are there. Um, but you just don't want it on the books. And, um, and, and so I think that's uh, absolutely reason, uh, reasonable. Is it really radical thinking? Yes, but that's what we're here to talk about today, is you've got to think outside the box. And, and I think that um, you people are going to be leaving this workshop today and really literally asking yourselves, um, you know, what's in it for me? What are the takeaways? What are the things that I can look at? And certainly some of the no inventory or reduced inventory principles of ERP and lean have to be looked at very heavily. And notice the next three is standardized processes, components, and standardized tools. Some companies will put rules in design engineering that says all hardware must be in combinations of eighth of an inch. So you can't have an 1164th washer. Um, if you have a washer that's specified in, in, uh, in um, eighths of an inch, you can procure it at the local hardware store if you run out. If it's an 1164th washer, you've got to go to Belgium or something to get, to get the darn thing. So again, talking about standardizing of components, tools, and processes are very important to us. And then universal packaging, assembly lines, and equipment, equipment that we can very easily change over that will handle any type of uh, packaging. Um, one of the major accounts that we're working with right now, um, a large uh, game and toy manufacturer, um, they're changing over all of their corrugated to in-house um, um, uh, case um, shaping so that we're bringing in box board now and literally um, feeding the lines with um, that, we, that we can come up with 12 different types of packaging on a line rather than ordering unique size um, uh, corrugated. So again, everybody's going to decide what this means, but these are good universal statements, by the way, that those of you starting lean and really starting an ERP implementation, these are, this is a very good checklist for you to use, saying how we're rethinking our business while we're doing this. What are some examples of these business rules? Notice what it says here, factory uh, distribution lean business rules. I'd like to show you some customer service business rules. If you're making something to stock, a business rule might be A items will be shipped same day 95% of the time. A items not in stock will be shipped in five working days. Now notice if you're a make to order company, A items will be manufactured in five working days. A items with missing components will be manufactured in 10 working days. So you're literally making the statement on stock or make to order what your level of performance is going to be. Let's look at C's. I always like these C's. C items, if you're a make to stock, will be shipped the same day 70% of the time. C items not in stock, you'll quote delivery. And what you're trying to do there is avoiding putting a C item on the factory floor all by itself just to satisfy that customer. Now, if it's an A customer, you may have to do that. But if it's a C item for a C customer and you don't quote delivery, you just say, hey, I've got to ship this immediately. Um, you could be paying a tremendous amount in setup costs. You're going to lose your shirt on that item. Um, so again, everybody says we're supposed to be small, lot, and react immediately. Um, C companies, uh, C product being sold to a C customer, you should probably talk to that customer in Spanish, adios, and let them go to the competition because you're going to lose your shirt on that item anyway. So you uh, better make sure you're not doing a special setup for it. I notice if you're a make-to-order company with C items, C items will be manufactured in 15 working days, and every time you make it, you'll make a 10-week supply. You're going to risk putting some of that stuff in inventory. Remember, C items are 5% of your dollars. They're 50% of your part numbers. If you make a lot size of 10 weeks, it means nothing to your inventory. If you don't use it at the end of a year to throw it away, it's cheaper to do that than to try to make this again. The cost of the setup will kill you. So again, what you're trying to do, if it's make to order, C items will be manufactured in 15 working days. C items with missing components will be manufactured in 20 days. Again, trying to give you some lead time. Most of the time, you're going to have to go out and get raw material for those C items. So you, you, whether 20 days is right for you or 30 days, you'll need to decide. What's interesting about this overhead, though, is most of the companies that we work with don't have a document like this. And it's very important as you start ERP and as you start lean that this stuff gets defined. If it's not defined, what does sales expect? Sales expect you to have everything on the shelf at all times and 100% compliance. 
So again, these are very, very powerful tools um, if, you use those pro if you use them properly and, and decide at the beginning of your ERP and lean programs uh, to define them. How do you see the impact? We talked about a whole bunch of things right now. How do you see the impact of all of this on the bottom line? Companies are telling me all the time, we started lean programs and we never cashed them. We started ERP, we justified the ERP system on all of these things and we never cashed them. And what we'd like to do is to just show you some various models right now of how you can show the impact of this. Some companies say, we're going to have some teams that are going to uh, increase sales and those increases in sales, I've got to be able to see the impact of that on the bottom line. Line. I've got to be able to see a discounting strategy. If we start lowering our prices, what's the discounting strategy? What's the impact on the bottom line? I've got to be able to see productivity improvement. If we're, if we're increasing our productivity by 3 or 5 or 10 percent, if I'm changing my lower, if I've got higher supply chain costs, I've got to be able to see the impact of that. If I'm going to dramatically lower my inventory or my cash flow, if my audited cash cycle gets collapsed, what's the impact of that? And so what we'd like to do is to show you a couple of models that we have. And again, if you just want to leave your business card, if you want to put the business card um, in that fishbowl in the back there, we'll gladly send you these models. The models, by the way, are basic in understanding. They're relatively easy to do. If we look at this first model, by the way, a sales plan uh, talks about in 2000 and five and notice this this whole model is being developed around a strategy that says this is a 50 million dollar company that in, in 2005 and what they want to do and, and that was the original plan but what they said was we want a 20 percent increase in sales and the only way they could do it was by discounting that incremental sales by 20 percent and that's what's in those last two columns so it says sales is another 13 million coming in that's going to be discounted 20% that will result in $10 million of, of sales. And so the new plan is going to be $60 million. We're going from 50 to $60 million. And what's the impact? And here's the material labor and burden. And here's the fixed costs. And the fixed costs for manufacturing. The fixed costs for businesses. And you can fast see here that in discounting by 20% that incremental business results in a 49% increase in profit. Now taking that model, and again we'll give you all of these models, we've got them, you can very easily change whatever your material labor and burden numbers are, just plug them in and this model will deliver those. Those models can be looked at a slightly different way as you'll see on the next overhead. Look at what we tried to do. We have a 20% increase in sales that we showed on our previous model, but those sales models don't usually show the impact of changes in assets. So in this instance, we also said we're going to decrease our inventory over the next 12 months by $2 million, and we're also going to do a $1 million decrease in accounts receivable. Again, very easy to plug into a model like this. Notice in sales, the old number was 50, 000, was 50 million, the new number is 60. You've got your material labor and burden, old versus new, showing the changes in gross margin, by the way, from 24 to million to 28 million. Then all your fixed uh, business expenses. Then the changes in inventory from 11 million to 10 million. That's that $1 million decrease that's occurring over here. Um, your account, uh, accounts receivable um, uh, ch uh, changing, um, other current assets staying the same. Again, watching all of this information cascading, watching your net margins change from 9% to 11%. Those are phenomenal increases, by the way, phenomenal increases. Um, your asset turnover changing from 2.04% to 2.93%. Anytime you can incre uh, increase one, uh, one turn on asset turnover, that's how well we're using our inventory or our plant and equipment. Just unbelievable. And notice um, a massive increase here of 34%, um, uh, the 19% uh, versus 34%, a 44% increase in our return on assets, our return on net assets. Again, these models are very, very good tools to justifying and playing what if. What if we do this? If we do uh, pr uh, productivity first and we lower our labor costs, we can go in there and just change those new labor amounts, what would our um, return on investment be? So these models, we spent a lot of time in our company putting these models together. Again, if you just throw a card in the fishbowl, we'll, um, we'll gladly send you these models. We've got them all on. A CD for you. We also have a very nice write-up, by the way, on how all of this works. So if you'd like to see a whole write-up on this uh, white paper, on this uh, presentation, we would gladly do that for you.
As part of this justification, we need a thing called dashboards. It used to be the old system, we just called the measurements. The measurements weren't enough. We really need to um, have a dashboard because a dashboard, we want to be able to see data in as close to real time as we can. Now, sometimes it's not always real time, but if I want to know the number of overdue production orders, I don't really want to know at the end of the month. I really want to know every day. So I want somebody to get up out of their chair at the end of the day and literally put the number of production orders that that planner has or purchasing number of overdue purchase orders. So what are the dashboard? What are the key measurements that you need? Again, what you're trying to do is look at those business rules we talked about, look at your strategies and tactics, and then the detailed plans. Say, what's the dashboard? The teams were supposed to finish in 90 days. Do you have a dashboard to show how well those teams are doing? So the challenge for us is to develop a scorecard or a dashboard that can really measure and tell us how our lean programs are doing, our ERP implementations, and our productivity programs are doing. The new next generation metrics, uh, those of you that are really into um, uh, next generation manufacturing, some good stuff off of websites, by the way, if you take some time. I know it takes a couple of hours to search all of these engines, but it's a lot of wonderful stuff that's out there right now. Um, but I like a process that, I, that we call in our firm super measurements. Notice some of these things. I want to see the dollar shipped per square foot. And it better be getting, go back two or three years and say, this is the entire footprint that we've got in our facility right now, warehouses, on-site and off-site. What's the total square footage that we're renting or deploying? And are we getting more product out the door with that square footage? And if we're not, by the way, and this is non-inflationary dollars, if we're not, then we haven't improved much. Look at this next one, dollar shipped per total payroll dollar deployed. Don't get caught up in whether it's direct labor or indirect labor or factory labor or office area labor, take the entire payroll and put it into a system and say, what's the dollar shipped? And are we getting more productive with that payroll? We can look at this third one, dollar shipped per asset dollar deploy. Take all your assets, your plant and facilities, your inventory, lump them all into one item. See, this is our total assets. Accounting's got that. And dollar shipped. And are we doing better year on year? We better be getting more product out with the assets that we're deploying. And by the way, it may mean we need second and third shifts or start running Saturday and Sunday. We got maybe machine utilization. There's a thing called OEE um, that we need to talk about um, um, in manufacturing today, um, uh, the, all the operational effectiveness issues. But we need to certainly get more dollar shipped for asset dollar de deployed. And four, dollar shipped for inventory dollar deployed. And that's how we're really making effective use of our inventory. So again, what are our total shipments versus dollars? And it's kind of inventory is a backwards approach to getting um, our inventory uh, turns. But again, very important way to, um, to measure uh, from a super measure point of view. There's some other measures, and I'm not going to go, go, go through these all. But again, next generation manufacturing starts to talk about some of the fundamentals of our business. The first one says, are you reducing your cycle time on all your major processes? The next one says, are you reducing your cost for products and services? And are you showing a cost reduction? The next one says, are you training that the majority of your core people are certified and well trained? That you're getting, that you're, you've got some turnover core people so you keep the outside, um, so you're not being coming too incestual as a, as a, incestuous as a company. Um, but again, we need to have a certain turnover core people, but if it's excessive, it will really hurt the company. And notice what Five talks about is innovation. That 12% of total sales are coming for new products. There are many companies that are introducing new products constantly. And those of you that followed some of the uh, things that were happening to you know, people like Kellogg's and Campbell Soup, for a while they were coming out with all these new offerings and it was the core brand, it was the core um, chicken noodle soup and everything that was still selling and the new products were not carrying. That's not the case now, by the way. These companies have gotten very innovative with their new products and now new products are commanding a lot more um, SKU position in the, in the stores. But what the these next generation metrics are the non-traditional stuff. It says, am I laying the foundation for a well-behaved and a well-run company in the next few years? And those are the things that I need to do. So it doesn't talk about, in these instances, what's my scrap or rework numbers. It says, am I literally putting a process in place that will allow us to, um, to grow and to really be innovative as a company? What's the value proposition? for doing what we're talking about today, this lean ERP technology. 
I'm going to take a couple of minutes to talk about on two overheads right now about the value proposition. First, and we must really focus on what first means, is IT must recognize that lean software initiatives are different. And IT needs to help the manufacturing people come up with much more flexible solutions and new and unique ways to deal with all the operations initiatives. It's a tremendous amount of complexity happening out on the factory floor. And then we want to literally figure out what's all that software doing right now and what are the things that we can do with that software um, that will make us a heck of a lot more lean and agile on that factory floor. Secondly, the value of lean, if we look at ERP manufacturing software, any manufacturing software can be greatly enhanced when it is implemented with all the other changes to your other processes. And what are your processes? You have internal processes, your production orders, your purchase orders, your supplier processes, and how all the receiving issues and uh, purchase order process for your suppliers, and your customer processes, all your shipping papers and your delivery, and your point of consumption delivery to your customer. We really need to talk about what all of those processes are. There's no single one magic bullet. We don't have any fairy dust for your companies right now. You're literally trying to reinvent yourself using a lot of lean thinking, what we call thoughtware, and ERP thinking, which is your software. Being question. Bob, if this, not, if this is not done in conjunction, do you find, if lean and ERP is not done in conjunction, do you find that companies revert back to underground systems and disparate systems running around the shop floor and, and in the office area and in the sales department? Yeah, the, the, for sure, Dan. If we, we see a tremendous amount of access databases being set up and Excel databases and all these. The, the, the old legacy systems were kind of done manually, but so at least they're using some office tools. But the fact of the matter is, is there's all these underground systems, what we call tribal knowledge systems, that'll spring up. You've got to reinvent your systems. You've got to reinvent your company to some degree. Um, how much is, you, you've got to um, you know, ask yourself how much change you can digest, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But for the most part, if, you, if you're not reinventing your company while you're installing the software or while you're doing lean, if you're not really looking for um, your significant or dramatic changes, um, all of those disparate systems will... Um, will certainly come to be. It's a major problem for most companies today, by the way. Workers, very quickly, whether it's shop or office, will come up with a workaround. Okay, the minute the, the going gets tough. What are you expecting out of this, the value proposition? Well, the benefits certainly a dramatically improved information flow and certainly more flexible software that is easily more reconfigurable. We need software that can change Kanbans on a moment's notice. If we have seasonality, we've got to be able to change our lot sizes very quick. We've got to be able to redo our auto modifiers every quarter. We need to have much better flow in the factory. Our internal and external sequence delivery systems have got to be top notch and we'll certainly see much better flow in the factory. When ERP and Lean are done together, you'll see dramatically improvements in inventory and usually dramatic improvements in cost. Um, when ERP and done, uh, are done together, the whole issue of volatile demand changes in the front end, um, it doesn't go away, but it certainly gives us the ability to handle this better. Um, those of you that are waiting for a per uh, perfect forecast, forget it. You're not going to get one. You, you never will. We need to be able to handle demand in whole new ways. We need to be able to call customers and get the demand from them. And um, when we can't get the demand, whatever the demand comes in, we need to scream that, um, that, that demand through our plants and supply chain at a dreamed of speed um, because that's the realities of life. We're not going to get good forecasts. We've got to figure out a whole different way to respond to that volatile marketplace. We've got to have a managed supply chain, and certainly the benefits should see that placing inventory along the supply chain uh, where we need it to supply to, um, supply, um, to that the volatile demand. We need to have a managed supply chain also to make sure we don't have too much purchase order commitment out there. Our suppliers, by the way, marking everything, inspecting everything, uh, certified, powering up our product and everything else so there's um, um, immediate uh, po uh, point of consumption um, uh, processes available to us. So our benefits should absolutely see a managed supply chain. Dan? Bob, does that mean that uh, lean is as important to the supply chain as it is to the factory and the front end offices? 
Well, when lean, when lean initiatives first started in America, they were very focused on the factory floor. When lean initiatives started at Toyota, they were focused on the supply chain. Toyota focused almost all of the early their early efforts. They didn't call it lean, but their, um, their the Toyota model um, was all focused on the supply chain first. And once they got the supply chain under control, they began to focus it internally in their plants. That was not the American model. The American model tend to focus on the supply, on the factory floor first. And after they've got the factory floor side of out of control, the, um, uh, under control, and now they're focusing it on the supply chain. But we tell companies that are starting lean initiatives very early on, you've got to get after that supply chain quick. Um, it's where all the money is. It's where all the lack of response is. It's where all the lead time usually is. Um, so we really need to talk about a managed supply chain. Um, the value proposition, number eight, dramatically improved customer service. We need to ship on time with very short lead times, and we need to do it as close to 100% of the time as we possibly can, and we should see that. And we should see dramatically improved OEE. Those of you who start lean initiatives will see a term being banted around everywhere today. And um, operating equipment effectiveness, and that's how well we're using all our plant and equipment um, on the factory floor, and everything is in that number. And, um, and basically, as you improve OEE, just a few percentage points, the dramatic improvement of bottom line results um, will come about. So again, is there a value preparation, um, a proposition to doing this? Yes. Most companies, though, that start lean don't so much even go through this. They're buying lean and ERP systems today saying, I need them to compete. I don't even need to justify this stuff anymore. I have to have these as basic tools if I'm going to compete in the marketplace today. We still ask you to go through a checklist and, and try to come up. That's why we like that, um, that um, model. Uh, we, we constantly urge people to um, use a formal model when they're doing this. One of my favorite quotes is managing changes like wrestling with a gorilla. You don't stop. When you get tired, you stop and a gorilla gets tired. And we've talked about a lot of things today, paperless purchasing and paperless factory on, 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 on the floor and all these things that we've got to do. And oh, what do I start first, second, and third? Hey, this is very big. I'm, we're the first ones to, um, to admit this. But if you set out a good plan and you follow that pyramid that we had earlier and you look at that strategies and tactics and detailed plans and get your arms about this, you will you will absolutely be able to set your priorities straight and you'll absolutely see the results. But why results don't happen in some companies is a result of these three boxes. I want to go over those three boxes with you, this formula for change. The first box says, do you as a company have a vision of the future? Well, that's what this presentation was all about. It says, do you have a vision of the future? And most of you can go back and you can prepare those lean agile when. If you don't want to prepare them, we we'll help you when we come in and do uh, your lean audits. And we help you prepare all of those department by department. But you can come up pretty, pretty well with the vision of the future. If you notice the other thing that we talked about is the path of low risk. The stuff we're talking about today, we're not talking about building new buildings and buying a lot of new machinery and all of this stuff. We're talking about rethinking how you're going to run your business. And is there a path of low risk? Yes, you can always go back to running it the other way. You can install a new RP, uh, ERP system if you want to look exactly like your old legacy system if you want. So the risk isn't there. But why most companies don't change, and you need these three elements, is most companies, and this is why this box is bigger, is we're not really that discontent with the present. When we say to people, are you discontent? Yes, I want to do something different. And then when you say, well, are you willing to go through this two to four year journey of, of ERP and lean and reinvent yourself and literally come up with a new business model, oh, I don't know whether I'm that discontent. This is too much work. Oh my God, purchasing, um, paperless purchasing, I have to redo all my documentation and sabbane's actually, and uh, we got all the reasons why we don't do it. So change doesn't happen. So many of you, if you're a profitable company right now and things are going pretty good, it's going to be a, a little more difficult for change to occur. If you're in Chapter 11 or close to Chapter 11 and you watch your marketplace disappear like crazy, it's easier to change because you, you already know you need a new model. But many companies struggle with this need to change because they're not really that discontent. Um, it's a great book out, out there called Leading Change by a guy named um, John Carter. If you haven't read that book, I would strongly urge you to, um, to read it. And he talks about companies need a significant event. If they don't go into Chapter 11, they have to make a believe they're going into Chapter 11. 
And, um, and he said they have to approach this thing as that serious because five years from now, he maintains, you, you will end up going to chapter 11. Um, but in any case, just look at an overhead like this and ask yourself, how discontent is your company right now with the present? And change will happen a little more difficult if you're not very discontent. I'm going to leave you with one last thought. There are two ways to get on top of an oak tree. You can climb it or you can sit on an acorn. Both will get you there, slightly different speeds. We covered a lot today in this workshop. I hope you found it valuable. What's the key message here? Go back and start to define those strategies, tactics, detail plans. Get a vision set up. Spend a little bit of time in the front end. If you, those of you that are just out buying software for the first time, you just recently signed contracts, before you get going too far, sit down with this so you're telling your implementation team to install software on what you want to look like in the future. Make sure they put some of these key enablers in place. If you believe you're going to do lean on the factory floor and that Kanban is going to be an issue, make sure when you're installing that software that those key enabling tools are in place so as you start to migrate either Kanban to your supplier or Kanban across your factory floor that you have these tools. This is a very exciting time for American industry. It's a very difficult time for us to compete, but the companies that really try to reinvent themselves throughout this pro their process will absolutely be able to compete. Again, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Drop your cards in the fishbowl in the back there and we'll gladly get you a copy of this to get out right away. Thank